Hi there, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, John Iverson. And this week, I'm joined by Lisa Raitt, who is the former deputy leader of the Conservative Party, managing director of global investment banking at CIBC, and the co-chair of a body called the Coalition for a Better Future, which is committed to a more inclusive, sustainable and prosperous Canada. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks very much for coming on. Appreciate it, John. So I thought that the launch of the coalition was a great idea because it brought back to the forefront of the debate the idea of economic growth, which I think for a period of time had become a dirty word. Um, it seems to have been well received by a broad cross-section of Canadians. Yeah, it has. So um, when I was still in politics, it was really easy to see that in seven federal election campaigns, five of them returned minority governments and none of them talked about long term economic growth. It was a dirty word. And a lot of folks started to get very concerned that other countries were building back better. Um, and we didn't seem to be paying a lot of attention to what was going on. So it was decided that the most effective way to help governments and private sector and civil society work closely together would be to come up with a standard scorecard, scorecard rather, scorecard that would allow us to see how we're doing. So no judgments on what policies are being put in place, no judgments on what positions companies were taking. This was all about measuring certain KPIs, key performance indicators that were gonna give us a true picture of where Canada was going and what we needed to work on more. So we launched it last year, and this is the first year that we're measuring trends based upon one year's information. So on Tuesday, the 2023 scorecard, I guess it's measuring 2022, uh, is released looking at Canada's progress towards a better future. Could you just give us the, the, the headline numbers? What's, what's, how would you summarize its findings? So mixed bag, we've got some positive trends and we've got some negative trends that are going on. Negative trends are concerning. Positive trends deserve to be pointed to and say, this is the right direction we're going in. On the negative ones, indicating, okay, business and government, we've got some work to do. So the scorecard is set up so that it uses 21 different metrics across three main pillars. And, and those pillars are increasing prosperity for all, winning globally yeah. and growing sustainably. And if we can take those yeah. in turn, so when it comes to living better, uh, it does seem that some of those metrics are going in the right direction, others maybe not fast enough. So let's look at the plus side first. The share of Canadians in poverty is at the lowest level in decades. The share of women in senior management has increased marginally. And Indigenous Canadians are seeing better labour market outcomes than for many years. And this surprised me. Labour participation rates have surpassed, for, for Indigenous Canadians, have surpassed non-Indigenous rates for the first time. Yeah. So I agree with you. So I don't think the woman stat is as strong as it. I would put that in the yellow category. If it's red, green, yellow, I would say there's a warning light flashing for me there. As you pointed out, it hasn't moved in 20, since 2016. And we've had some significant public policy levers put in place to increase the number of women in senior management positions, and it's not working. I, can, I think it's easy to say that it's not working. We are stalled out at 29%. It was higher in 2016 than it is right now. So I would say there's concern around there. On the indigenous labor participation, so nice to see. Such a great and, and wonderful statistic to see that our indigenous people are moving into uh, the workforce in a significant way, outpacing others. However, again, buried below that is the fact that the most, uh, I would say, sector of, of, of the population that we measure in terms of education uh, the lowest is Indigenous women. So definitely public policy work needs to be done in that area. Um, but the broader broader picture uh, when it comes to living better is taking a look at how we're doing in median incomes. And quite frankly, we're not doing well. So I was going to come on to the negative side. Uh, yeah. GDP per capita is below pre-pandemic levels. Pay not keeping pace with the cost of inflation, or sorry, with the cost of living, and not just because of inflation. Real median wages have fallen uh, since 2019 on an international prosperity index of 167 countries Canada is at 15 down yeah. four places in relative terms not great it sounds like we're getting poorer oh uh, in relative I mean just in terms period not great and I think right. Canadian families will tell you that that things yeah. are not great. so the GDP per capita and the prosperity index are actually the two big wraparound 
pieces of information that frame the entire circle for us. They're the, the most important indicators that we have. And they're, they're above all of the pillars below it. And in both cases, we're dropping in the prosperity index, and we've been dropping for the past five years. And on the GDP per capita, we're dropping as well. And that is of great concern. And when you when you go into the details under living better and you see that median wage decreasing the way that's people's purchasing power. And that is extremely important. I mean, there may be some COVID stuff in there, but it has been dropping significantly. And productivity per hour for a worker, whereas our, our peers are all moving up or stabilized, we're continuing to drop. So there are some significant questions to be asked of governments, of society. Is this really the Canada that we want? And I would suggest that the data is showing us we're not going in the right direction. The one key indicator, um, which I think is mentioned, but there's not a separate graph on it, is, is productivity. And I was looking at some productivity data earlier today. You know, Canada, when it comes to GDP per hour worked, is yeah. below the G7. Um, it's, it averages around half of what Ireland does, which really surprised me. Well below most of our peers. Yeah. We're ahead of Portugal and Greece, but uh, you know when we compare ourselves, we generally compare ourselves to the best, and we're not up there with the best. Yep. And you know, part of that is our companies investing in their workers. Are they being given the tools that they need in order to increase their productivity? Like I said, this isn't about government bashing. And this isn't about bashing corporate Canada. Everybody has an accountability piece and a responsibility piece in this. And we're showing the information to say, we have a problem with productivity. There's no question about it. It's not about whether or not people are working less hours because we aren't. The question comes down to how are they working in that hour? And we also see in this information that business investment is down and continues to be down. So I was going to come on to that. That's the second pillar of global success. And the story, again, is pretty bleak. Uh, research and development as a percentage of GDP is stagnant. The percentage spent on machinery is becalmed, and that's not likely to rise with, with uh, higher interest rates. There does seem to be a slight improvement in the number of companies that are in the top 10 of their industries, but that number is 20, and it's still probably around half of where you think it might get to. Yeah, well, it's really important to compare ourselves globally, and that's what these APIs try to do, to see where we are vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, because we need to compete with the rest of the world, because we are an exporting country. And what you are seeing is some areas in which we're not doing as well as we think we are. Business investment has been a concern, I think, of every government since... Uh, you go all the way back, John. I mean, it's... it's well, as long always, as I've been on the hill, for sure. Everybody talks about always, it and nothing really appears to get done. You know, what's happening on business investment and different policies have come out uh, along the way. We've cut taxes. We've done all kinds of things um, in this country in order to try to foster business investment. And we're looking at what the United States is doing. We're looking at what other countries are doing. That is a problem that public policy thought leaders have to get their heads around because it has such an impact on all the other things that we need to be a profitable and, and I would say prosperous country. So much attention needs to be there and they have to answer. One point of light on the, on the, the <clears throat> global success thing was the number of private tech startups with a billion dollar valuation, which has already surpassed your 2030 target. What's, I know. what's going on there? Which, as you know, we call narwhals. That's the terminology for these Canadian tech. So what we understand from the Telfer School of Business, that foreign investment has a lot to say in that, you know, investment coming in from other countries, supporting our, our nascent tech companies and moving them to that billion dollars. I, I guess the question becomes, do they stay in Canada or do they go? And we'll have to, we'll have to watch for that. And these numbers will show how that works out in terms right. of, of how many narwhals we retain. The third pillar, sustainable growth. Yeah. Uh, the report warned that change that is too drastic could undermine public confidence and public support while not going fast enough is not an option. Do you think we're in that Goldilocks spot or do we have work to do there too? I think we have no choice but to move fast. I think the urgency that we're seeing is real uh, and it's verifiable by the data that has been collected and analyzed. We're going to continue to do these scorecards till 2030 because we think that's really important to get that overall picture. 
you know, today um, I'm at the I'm at the uh, the school um, at the University of Ottawa, and we're hearing from young people, and we've been plugged into young people from across the country. And they want accountability, and they want to have say in what's going on. So hopefully, with a scorecard like this, they're going to know exactly what everybody else knows in public policy shops, in ministers' offices, and in CEOs' offices. And they're going to have a say on what they think policy should look like in order to move it in the direction that they want to move it in. Um, but we're falling behind fast. And it's some areas we're doing great. You pointed them out, but others were not. And urgency is not something to be trifled with because the United States is moving hard on things like the Inflation Reduction Act, on the Infrastructure Act, on the CHIPS bill. I mean, they are moving very much at, faster than the pace of business. At the same time as you're urging speed and urgency, the report also mentions that fossil fuel sources provided somewhere around $200 billion in export receipts. Uh, and, and the quote from the report is making it almost impossible to replace as a source, source of foreign exchange and economic growth. Yeah. What, what do you say to people, presumably some of whom are part of your coalition, who want faster action on the transition from fossil fuels? Well, the data speaks for itself. And the reality is, is that if you don't like our GDP numbers right now, if you move too quickly in eradicating fossil fuels, they're going to get worse. And when that gets worse, it has an impact on how well you live and how sustainable our economy is. And it's all interrelated. So we don't get into the business of lobbying for policy, but we can show you in terms of the numbers that an exporting country like Canada certainly needs the oil and gas as part of it. And actually, John, I don't think there's a government in Canada that disagrees with that notion that oil and gas is going to be an important part of the economy for a number of years. Joe Biden said it himself in his State of the Union. That's not the arguing point. The point is we are moving to transition. Take a look at the clean tech stuff in the in the data as well. I mean, beautiful work in clean tech. Canada's doing really, really well, and we should be proud of that but it doesn't substitute for oil and gas and GDP. So you have to consider the spectrum, the whole of the 21 KPIs, and they are an important piece of it. You can't push too hard in one direction. So when we talk about urgency, one thing Ann and I do talk about is something that governments control, and that's regulatory process. And a regulatory process is incredibly important for us in this energy transition, to be nimble, to be quick, to be focused, and get done what needs to get done in order for the transition to happen for sustainable jobs, sustainable communities, sustainable economy, that's inclusive. Uh, the Anne you're talking about is the Honourable Anne McClellan, who is your co-chair, former Deputy Prime Minister, a, a former Liberal MP, which gives some sense of what the organisation is about. It's meant to be non-partisan. But the, the report does seem to me to be a substantiation of public policy as a lever. The areas where the federal government has placed emphasis appear to have seen improvement. Maybe let's talk about inclusi inclusivity and maybe sustainability. The areas where it has arguably neglected public policy and competitiveness, investment and productivity are the areas where we're, we're falling behind as far as I can see. Is that a fair conclusion? I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, I think that's where the data draws you to. And that's the purpose of the scorecard, to put the information out in an unbiased way, performed by a third party independent group we chose the KPIs based upon what we thought were important indicators for the country. And we've told everybody that we're going to be publishing the information that comes from it. And if that's the if that's what you draw from it, and a lot of people will draw the same thing, um, then more attention should be placed upon certain parts of the economy so that we do better. And applause to the government for putting attention on areas that are extremely important that have moved in the right direction. Finally, uh we are faced with some bracing headwinds, inflation, economic slowdown, geopolitical upheaval, high debt levels, and a trend towards uh, deglobalization that doesn't particularly work in the favor of a, an export-oriented country like Canada. Should Canadians be optimistic or pessimistic about a more prosperous future? Oh, well, they should be optimistic. You should always be optimistic. Um, and the reason why you should be optimistic is we recognize the importance of having a prosperous future and that there are 144 organizations that represent millions of people who care enough to want to help measure this as we go forward so that people have the information and can hold people accountable to what's going on. So I'm happy about that. I think that that is 
uh, a positive note for, for people to have, but they have to pay attention. And we have to communicate this over and over and over again that when you go into an election, it can't just be about issue of the day or you can't look for gotcha politics anymore. We need the bigger vision and we need the, we need the bigger thought around where the country is going because the world is moving in different directions. And to your point on inflation, if there's something that's really going to hit immigration and the median incomes, it's going to be inflation. And that will be felt at the, box, at, at the ballot box. You mean you don't miss gotcha politics? Not at all. Not at all. I just, uh, I'd rather see that clear line of sight to prosperity for all Canadians. Great. Well, listen, thank you very much for coming on, Lisa. Be well.